So it's my pleasure to introduce tonight's uh, speaker, Dr. Sadir Gupta. Uh, Sadir is an associate professor in SFU's BD School of Business and director of the Jack Austin Center for Asia Pacific Business Studies. And I want to note as well, we also have the dean of uh, the uh, BD School of Business with us tonight, Danny Shapiro. And this is a sort of propitious time for business in Surrey because uh, thanks to uh, Dean Shapiro's uh, direction and leadership, uh, for the first time SFU is offering a part-time MBA program here in Surrey in addition to our undergraduate business program. So the business program is very much, in fact, more than ever alive and well uh, here in Surrey. And we're delighted, therefore, to be able to bring uh, to you uh, one of the members of the business faculty, Dr. Gupta. Uh, Sadir is currently involved in numerous research projects focused on social and environmental sustainability, on global supply networks, on emerging markets and economic development, as well as on innovation and technology adoption. He connects research to practice by engaging students in his research projects, as well as by collaborating with industry. He also engages with communities through public seminars and lectures at the Jack Austin Center and collaborations with the Asia Pacific Foundation, including a project focused on understanding foreign direct investment patterns from China to Canada. He's a board member of the Canada-India Business Council, whose mandate is to promote better relations and trade between Canada and India. Uh, Sadir joined SFU in 2005. He was formerly a faculty member at the University of Michigan. He's been a visiting scholar at the University of California, at the University of Texas, HEC Paris, and the Indian Institute of Management, well-traveled, um, and uh, someone who brings with him a wealth of knowledge and insight. And with that, I know we're looking forward to hearing from him, so please join with me in welcoming Dr. Sadir Gupta. Thank you, Mr. President. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, let me make sure that uh, everyone can hear me. Okay. Uh, it's, it's truly an honor to be part of this uh, lecture series and to be able to share some of the work that we've been doing uh, with, with the community. Um, I, I, I really much look forward to your feedback. This is very much a work in progress that, uh, uh, that we started about a couple of years ago. Uh, and uh, we'll see how to, uh, to incorporate uh, some of the feedback that uh, uh, that you have. I'll, I'll, I'll jump into it right away, uh, talk a little bit about the, the poverty in the world, uh, share a little bit of the data with you that uh, got us started to work on this project and what it means to live in poverty before I uh, can share the details of the study that uh, we've been doing for the last couple of years. Um, in terms of uh, definition, uh, a, a simple definition that World Bank uses is uh, less than $1.25 a day. Uh, uh, as the extreme poverty line. And by that definition, if you take a look at the numbers, you have about 20% of the, the, the world's population or about 1.3 billion people living on less than $1.25 a day. And uh, a majority of them tend to be in South Asia and, and Sub-Saharan Africa. If you look at uh, the figures slightly differently, it's about uh, 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 $2 a day, which is the median poverty line in uh, most of the developing countries. The numbers actually double. You have about 2.4 billion people uh, living below that poverty line, about 40% of the, the, the world's population, uh, about 6 to 7% of South Asia, 70% of Sub-Saharan Africa qualify as poor under that definition. Slightly higher levels of, uh, of well-being, we have about uh, $8 a day, and the numbers truly become staggering. This is about $3,000 a year that we're talking about. Uh, South Asia has about 99% of the population that would qualify as poor under that definition, and the Sub-Saharan Africa about 97% of the population, for a total of about 85% of the world that lives on less than $3,000 a year. So this, is, um, this has prompted you know, people to look closely at what has been referred to in the literature as bottom of the pyramid, people who live on less than, uh, less than $2, $4, or $8 uh, a day, the definitions can vary, but uh, quite an influential article that, uh, that was written a few years ago uh, uses about $4 a day as the, as the average, less than $1,500 a year. And by that definition, we have about 4 billion people belonging to what is known as the BOP, or the bottom of the pyramid uh, in, the, in, in, in the world. So the um, uh, people have also tried to study that, that BOP a little bit better in terms of uh, trying to understand how, how the BOP lives, how the, how the population in the, in, at the bottom lives, and uh, what is the aggregate purchasing power, and where, where do they spend uh, some of that money. 
by, by, by some measures, um, the aggregate purchasing power, if you look at about $3,000 a year as the, as the poverty line, is about $5 trillion. Uh, and that can be further kind of sliced and diced by regions, uh, by country, and so on. Uh, but out of that $5 trillion, you have about $3.5 billion $3.5 trillion or so being concentrated in Asia itself. The, uh, uh, where, do, where do poor spend the money? It's not surprising then. If you look at the, the level below dollar a day, 73% of the, of the spend, of the household spend, goes to, goes to food. Another 27% to other essentials such as fuel, housing, transport, education, medicines, etc. And as the incomes rise, the discretionary spend on consumer goods, communication, entertainment increases, and the relative spend on, on food uh, goes down. So the, uh, the, this is the data. So what does it mean to live in poverty? What, is, what are the implications of uh, living on less than $2 or $4 uh, a day? And what researchers have found consistently is the, the, single most, uh, the single most important implication of living in poverty is lack of access to basic necessities of life. And that means food, shelter, clothing, water, sanitation, education, healthcare, electricity, credit, financial services, legal title to dwellings. Okay. This, uh, um, so, so the pictures would actually show uh, that a little bit better what it means to live on less than dollar or two dollars a day. Lack of food, shelter, clothing, lack of uh, water, sanitation, healthcare, which means that you can't just turn on the tap and, and get clean water. Uh, you can't uh, 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 send your kids to, to the neighborhood clinic if, if you need medical care. You can't uh, uh, flip the switch and, and le get electricity when you need it. You can't uh, uh, send your kids to school because there are none, and so on and so forth. So uh, this is the reality of living on uh, uh, less than $2 or less than $1 a, a day. The, uh, and I'm not being sensationalistic by, by using those pictures. This is backed up by data that uh, uh, that World Bank uh, uh, shares, uh, in a recent report, they, they, it was kind of found that you have about 26% uh, of the poor lacking, uh, about 26% of the poor have access to water, the rest of the population does not, compared to about 56% of the non-poor who have access to water. Same with sanitation, about 20% of the poor have access to sanitary facilities versus 61% of the non-poor, and about 49% electricity versus 87% of non-poor. So the lack of access is a big, big problem that, uh, that needs to be resolved in, in multiple ways. The second implication of um, being poor is dependence on informal livelihoods, that, that most of the poor lack uh, steady incomes, lack steady jobs, and tend to rely on informal economy. Uh, that, that means that they have, they have unequal access to information, they have unequal access to markets, and tend to be uniquely vulnerable to any of the natural uh, destruction uh, of, of resources that, that, that happens. The, uh, the third uh, implication is very, very interesting, that what is referred to as BOP penalty, or essentially penalty for being poor, that poor tend to pay more for most of the basic uh, goods and services than the rich people. Uh, and this, this, is, uh, uh, this was confirmed by a study that, again, a few years ago uh, was very popular. Uh, the, the BOP penalty, this, this study uh, defined as follows, that they, they looked at Two of the uh, uh, neighborhoods in, in Mumbai, in India, the Harvey is one of the biggest slums uh, in, in Mumbai, and Warden Road is probably one of the, the more upscale-ish areas uh, in, in Mumbai. If you look at the, the access to basic goods and services and how much poor pay versus the, how much the rich pay, it is staggering. That rice can be about uh, 1.2 times as, as much, uh, medication can be 10 times as much. Uh, uh, drinking water can be about 37 times as much. And access to credit can be 53 times as much as, as the rich people pay. And these, these, these um, communities are less than 15 kilometers uh, away from each other. So that's the background. This is, this is uh, the reality of, uh, of poverty in India, which led us to pose a simple question. Can business help? Uh, if not uh, eradicate poverty, at least alleviate poverty to some extent. And if yes, how? So um, with, that, with that research question, essentially we uh, uh, went out, looked for partners, and uh, for this study we partnered with Infosys. Uh, this was essentially uh, President Petter's initiative. Uh, about a couple of years ago, uh, the president led a team of SFU um, uh, uh, personnel to, as, as this was part of the BC Premier's uh, jobs and trade mission to India. Uh, 
the team met with uh, dozens of uh, educational institutes, uh, uh, private companies, non-private uh, companies, and so on and so forth. Infosys was one of them. Infosys is, as many of you know, uh, one of the biggest global IT services company based in Bangalore, uh, about $35 billion in revenue, 150,000 people that they employ, uh, and very, very interested in finding uh, what uh, this research can bring to the, uh, to the community. Uh, our principal collaborator on this has been Dr. Jay Ganesh, who is uh, with the Infosys Labs. Uh, but we also leveraged a very innovative internship program that Infosys has. This is called InStep. Uh, InStep program uh, gets about 100 or 150 uh, students from all over the world, different universities, uh, and they hook them up with, uh, with mentors from uh, Infosys as well as the uh, faculty from affiliated universities. And SFU is part of that, that program that, um, uh, that Infosys has. And this has been a big, big help in getting the data, getting access to all the organizations that we work with. Without that, we wouldn't have probably been able to do that. I'm sure, I guess one of the interns who worked on, on this is probably here. I'll maybe see later. Uh, the, in addition, we also leveraged academic industry partnerships that Infosys has with other universities, and that includes, for example, the Global Executive MBA program at, uh, at Georgetown and Isade, which is a joint program. And we have had about a dozen interns as well as students work on this project over the last couple of years. Okay. Uh, the, the study is also actually uh, supported by SFU, VP Research, BD School of Business, Jack Austin Center, uh, as well as Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council, which allowed us to get some of the resources that, that, uh, that we needed to attract PhD students like Stephanie, who have been working on, uh, on this project for some time, and postdoc fellows like Kurt, who is also here, I think. Uh, who, are, who are dedicated to bringing academic training and academic studies to, to, to see how society can be, uh, can be made better. So uh, this is, um, so my thanks to, to everyone who, who has made this, uh, this possible. So what is, what is the focus of this study? Uh, the focus was actually simple. We wanted to find sustainable solutions to poverty alleviation, which means that we wanted to find solutions from the ground up and solutions that balance revenue generation with social impact. So that excludes quite a few things. That excludes the uh, uh, top-down approaches that can be driven by government, that can be driven by uh, international uh, foundations, uh, so on and so forth. That also excludes uh, uh, multinationals for this part of the study from our, from our, from our focus. And uh, we hope to include multinationals uh, in, in a later part, but this is focused on solutions from the ground up and solutions that are sustainable. Okay. Uh, so over the last two years, we have studied about 95 organizations, and uh, these are across 11 industry sectors. Uh, those, can be, those are water sanitation, venture capital, microfinance, healthcare, energy, agriculture, education, technology, and what we call social development, which are organizations that work across uh, these industries. They are spread over four continents, uh, Africa, South Asia, East Asia, Latin America. Uh, we have not uh, included much of the organizations that work necessarily in North America alone, but there are global organizations that work across many of these uh, regions. The, uh, uh, by, by organization type, half of the participants were for-profit companies. So these are organizations that are legally structured as for-profit companies, but balance revenue generation with social impact. The about a third are nonprofits, but generate revenues. But we also talk to uh, the the foundation and NGOs to get their perspective. But uh, just to kind of make it clear, the this is not about how NGOs can help eradicate poverty. And I am sure there is a big role NGOs can play. This is about how business can help eradicate poverty. Okay. So uh, this is a, well, no TED talk is complete without a, a word cloud. So this is my attempt to, to em kind of emulate that. So these are some of the organizations that we talked to. Uh, I think I have time only to share with you about three or four of the stories, depending on uh, how we go. But uh, uh, all of them have very, very fascinating stories to tell and uh, fascinating business models that they have developed to, to have sustainable uh, solutions to, to societal challenges. So what is the first challenge that we, uh, that, that we saw uh, people tackle? Energy, electricity. So what, how big is that challenge? About 1.3 billion people lack access to electricity uh, in the world. 
And uh, if we include lack of reliable access to electricity, that's another billion people or so in the, in, in the world. About 585 million in sub-Saharan Africa, another 500 million or so in South Asia. In India alone, you have about 57% of the rural, 28% of the urban households, which will, be, which will qualify as being energy poor. Okay? That is about 140 million households that we're looking uh, at, which are, uh, which, have, which are without grid electricity. So most of these households rely on kerosene. Uh, kerosene lamps are used uh, throughout the developing world, but kerosene is risky. Kerosene has fire risk, kerosene has health risk, kerosene is non-renewable energy, and it can cost up to about 10 to 25% of the monthly income to, to turn on the lights uh, in, in, in these households. The uh, a related issue there is uh, indoor cooking, which uh, about more than 2 billion people in the world use biomass cooking, uh, and other smoky fumes that are used for, for indoor cooking, which is uh, labeled by WHO as the top 10 global killers in the, uh, in, in the world. The, um, uh, some of these pictures actually show how it is to live without electricity, essentially. Uh, what it means is that, that productive activity is limited to daylight hours, that uh, education suffers and you have fewer economic opportunities. And essentially, the, the impact is that you get trapped in poverty because you just don't have the ability to come out of, uh, of that. So what are some of the solutions that work? The, uh, we have talked to quite a few organizations consistently, very similar business model that, um, uh, that they have. So what I'm, what I'm going to do is just uh, talk about uh, two of them and show you how the business model that, that we see uh, that they use to come up with sustainable solutions is actually replicated across many of the, many of the organizations. The, the, the first company I'm going to talk about is Selco. Uh, it's a for-profit social enterprise based in India with the mission to enhance the quality of life of underserved households and livelihoods through sustainable energy solutions and services. Uh, founded in 1995, based in Bangalore, what do they do is customize solar lighting systems for homes and small businesses in primarily rural communities. So these are remote areas, rural areas, where uh, grid electricity is not available. This is where they focus to um, to implement their, their solutions. Here are some of these uh, installations that you see uh, that they have been able to, uh, uh, that they have been able to reach. Um, motivation for this company was very, very interesting. They say when you look at the, the, that uh, whole pyramid, the economic pyramid, and look at the energy needs, the, the poor, the, uh, those at the bottom, are really left in the dark, literally left in the dark. Uh, that no one really ne meets their needs and they cannot really pay. And the reason for that is that most organizations do not consider innovations for the BOP market a main priority for the company's business. Okay? That uh, this is too small and they cannot pay and this is not of interest to many of the organizations. They say manufacturers try to sell products designed for the developed markets to the BOP. They are unable to judge the needs of the end users, thus leading to the absence of product innovations. And uh, this is a sentiment that we heard consistently across all the organizations that we talk to, that try to develop products and services for the, for the, for the BOP, for the poor. And uh, uh, the, it, it is interesting to understand how the context in which this uh, organization developed its product. This is back in the 90s, there was a history of uh, solar installations uh, in India. Uh, most of them failed because these were driven by governments who lacked understanding of the context. There was no ownership, there was, uh, uh, no accountability in terms of maintaining the equipment, which led to a perception among people that solar doesn't work, that solar technology is a failure. And they, they, the organization had to go and, and kind of try to understand why it is that solar doesn't work before they could actually find a solution. What they found was that there's really a lack of understanding of user needs and the, and the environment in which, in which people use electricity in, um, in many of these developing uh, contexts. In addition, there was lack of institutions and infrastructure, that there is no uh, market research organization that, that you can tap to understand what people want and, and what their needs are. There is no venture capital available that you can tap to, to get the funds that you need to produce and to scale. There is no uh, distribution network that you can tap that uh, you can get the lights, uh, that you can use to uh, distribute the lights to the, to, the, to the people. So all of these uh, limitations lead to there being no innovation at all and there being lack of access to electricity in all of, these, all of these markets. So in addition, of course, there is lack of customer's ability to pay, which is a big, big constraint, which, which uh, prevents most of the organizations from trying to meet the needs of that market to begin with. 
So what they what they came up with is uh, uh, so I'm trying to present. I'll try and present that solution in about six steps, and uh, we'll show you how that six steps uh, are pretty much replicated across all of them. First, they need to understand the needs and the context uh, before they can even try to develop any kind of solution for the, for the market. So the founder actually lived without electricity for a year in Sri Lanka and India. He grew up in India and said, I, have, I really need to know how the poor live before I can develop a solution for that market. And then he spent time in the field to understand why the, the solar doesn't work, what are the barriers to implementation, what are the barriers to, to installation and use, and so on and so forth, and then they, they work to, to develop a solution. Second, that solution that uh, uh, you develop has to be appropriate for the context. So it, in this uh, example, they used existing proven technology, off-the-shelf technology, and, and used that technology to adapt to the needs of the, of the, of the poor. So essentially, this is a modular system based on bar 16 components, and mo most of those are fairly straightforward, solar panels, uh, uh, inverter, battery, uh, lamps, et cetera. And they can be used to customize to the different needs of, dif of, the, of the poor house households. Uh, what, what we have heard is that developing the solution is about 10% of the, of the solution. You have to actually develop the ecosystem around the solution before you have any chance the solution will get to the hands of the people that, uh, that are really going to need it. So the way Selco went about uh, developing the ecosystem is that they, 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 they partnered with a lot of manufacturers who produced all of the components to the, the, the exact needs of the, of the market. They also had an extensive branch network for demonstration, sales, installation, repairs, maintenance. And given the context, they realized that we really absolutely need that, that uh, network of uh, branches close to the consumers because consumers lack trust in the technology. So they, they, they need to not only just sell the lamps, they need to actually make sure that the lamps are customized, the lamps are installed, the lamps are maintained. Uh, and uh, uh, in, in, in addition to all of that, they actually use local individuals as employees because those individuals had the, the access to the community, they were trusted by the community, uh, and they could, they could speak to the community. Uh, they also developed local entrepreneurs around that solution. So for example, people who would be renting out batteries uh, at night and then charging them during the day, uh, making a business uh, uh, that way. So uh, next challenge that they had to, to, to overcome, as I have talked about earlier, is the ability to pay. The systems are costly. They, they cost about uh, five to 5,000 to 20,000 rupees, which is about 100 to $400. So people living on, on less than uh, 60 to $100 a month, that's a lot of money. So they needed to find a solution bef uh, to overcome that challenge before they could uh, have uh, a chance of that working. So what they did was very, very interesting, which was not done before ever in the, uh, in the solar lighting market, that they partnered with banks. And they convinced the banks to lend to the consumers who had no collateral. Uh, many of those even, don't even have an address, uh, let alone a, a collateral. Uh, but they convinced the banks that they need to lend the money for solar only. And they would stand behind that, that, that commitment, and they would show that consumers can actually pay uh, the, that loan back. And they also lobbied the government for solar loan portfolios that uh, allowed the, the banks to access money from, um, uh, from different sources that they could then use to, to lend money out for, uh, for installation of the, the solar systems in, in, in homes. Uh, then they had to convince the consumers that it is worth their while. So what they did was that they identified the savings for the consumers that you can reduce the use of kerosene, which is a big part of the expense, the healthcare costs. Uh, and you have expanded uh, capabilities for economic activities. That is longer working hours, new business opportunities, higher productivity, all of those that you could use to essentially pay back the loan that would make the, the solar uh, affordable for, uh, for, for these people. So having overcome that, the next challenge was they still needed to build trust, reach, awareness. Uh, among the people uh, that they were trying to, to sell the, the community. So essentially they, they built a doorstep presence uh, with having the extensive branch network where they could send out the technicians uh, on an as-needed basis to, to the homes, local people, customer solutions. And one of the biggest things they also did was partnered with the, the local NGOs. And one of their biggest partners has been SEVA, which I think many people probably know in this room. It stands for Self-Employed Women's Association. Uh, SEVA is one of the biggest uh, NGOs that is very well respected in India. And uh, that gave them a lot of credibility that, uh, uh, that the products are actually worth the, worth the while. Uh, 
and they partner with religious organizations like churches and, uh, and temples uh, to get the word out and get the communities buy-in to, to get the solution adopted. Yep. Final step is to balance social and financial objectives. That uh, They wanted to do it at, as a for-profit, but they had a very clear social mission in mind. And they made sure that that balance is achieved by having uh, people that what they call uh, follow the Selco way, uh, which means that people who come in into the organization having a very clear social objective in mind, but they balance that with, uh, with private sector approaches, that uh, they wanted to do it sustainably, so they say we will adopt all of the, the private sector approaches, efficiency, accountability, transparency, customer focus, to make sure that we can generate enough money to sustain ourselves uh, in, the, in, the, in, in the future. And I think this code pretty much captures that, um, that uh, mindset there. So this is still the mindset that really comes out here is one of saying, listen, that social objective is prime. We need to make money. We need to make the organization sustainable. But we should never forget that what we really set up for is to address that social need. Yep. And that's how they, 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 they work. And that's how they've been working for the last 20 years or so. So the, the, the final thing that in terms of balancing social and financial uh, objective is that they, they prioritize what we can refer to as patient capital over venture capital. So their, their investors are all nonprofit foundations who, uh, who give them the money, but then they expect returns over a long period of time. So they're not pushing them for fast growth. They're not pushing them for uh, uh, high returns in a short period of time. And uh, I'm going to skip this video. So what is the impact that this company has had? So far, they have sold about 150,000 solar systems. They expect to reach about three to 500,000 over the next three to five years. So there's still a long way to go, because there are 140 million households out there which lack electricity. Uh, for the people who have had the benefit of the, the solar systems from Selco, improved productivity, new income generation, higher quality of life, all those are clear. However, we think that their indirect impact has been much greater than, than the, the, the direct impact that we see. And that indirect impact uh, is as follows, that they created awareness and faith in solar. And that, that awareness and faith was necessary before other people could come in and, and find solutions in that, in that context. Uh, they also spurred financial innovation that uh, they allowed the banks to lend uh, uh, for solar systems, which was used by many, many later entrepreneurs as well. Uh, as, as, a, as a way to get around the, the affordability issue. They mentored other social entrepreneurs. They have been very, very open about sharing their business model, sharing their learnings, and so on uh, with anyone who, who uh, cares to replicate their model. Uh, solutions for related social challenges, like they had a, a Light for Education program where the child goes to the school and uh, brings the, the charged lamp back, and that's essentially what they're saying. The child empowers the home by going to school, which was a very, very effective way for them to... Uh, uh, to get a lot of people, in fact, to committed to, to sending their children to school. Uh, and overall, we think what they contributed in terms of um, a, the, the biggest uh, impact was a foundation for future entrepreneurial solutions who could scale that to a larger, uh, in, in a larger way. And one of that, one of the organizations that did uh, do that scaling <laughs> Much more, uh, much more rapidly and maybe a little bit more effectively in terms of numbers is Delight. Uh, Delight is another for-profit social enterprise this, with a very similar mission that, uh, that they have. Create new freedoms for customers without reliable power so they can enjoy a brighter future. They aim to empower the lives of at least 100 million people by 2020. So this is an organization that was founded in 2007. So very aggressive goals. It's based in San Francisco. Uh, they sell solar light in over 40 countries, over 10,000 retail outlets and field offices for regional hubs that they, that they have that they use for, uh, for their sales network. The context in which uh, D-Light started is very, very different. Uh, hence, their solutions are different. Uh, many of us remember uh, around 2006, 2007, that there was an increasing awareness of the global warming, uh, need for renewable energy solutions. Uh, all of these pictures are probably familiar to all of us. Uh, the ex-VP Al Gore was going around with his PowerPoint presentation, uh, um, uh, which led him to, to a Nobel Peace Prize in, the, in 2007, along with IPCC. Uh, but in general, much more awareness of the, of the harm of... Um, uh, global warming 
related issues. That was also a time where the capital, venture capital investments in clean tech were, were going up rapidly, uh, including solar and wind. And we, the, the world was seeing rapid advances in the LED technology, plastics, large scale manufacturing of solar components that brought down the costs of the, the solar lamp solutions for, uh, uh, for a lot of people. So in that context, uh, actually one more thing in that, in that, in that context was also Around this time, there were larger debates about the role of business and society in general, uh, or the whole proposition of do good, do, uh, do, good, do well, uh, whether that is sustainable as a, as a, as a business philosophy. The, um, the, the founders of this organization uh, had a very, very different experience from, from Selco's founder. They were MBA students at Stanford. Uh, and uh, one of them had experience in uh, in uh, uh, for-profit social enterprises in Africa. The other had a much more, uh, I should say, mainstream experience in Silicon Valley uh, startups. Uh, they, they met at, at Stanford and they uh, submitted this as a case competition uh, for a course at Stanford which is called Design for Extreme Affordability. So this is a partnership between the B school and the D school, that is the business school and the design school. And as the name says, the idea is to use the resources, use the, uh, uh, the ingenuity of people to come up with solutions for the poor. Okay. Uh, and uh, one of the, the, the influential founders of this program, this is what he says about, um, about what this program does. He says, well, I keep asking why 90% of the world's designers work exclu exclusively on products for the richest 10% of the world's customers. It's exactly the, the sentiment that was echoed by Selco about 15 years before this, these guys started. Okay? And this is the sentiment that we have been seeing across the organizations that we, that we talk to. So uh, with that, what are the solutions that they, that they came up with? First, understanding user needs and context. So it was much easier this time for, for this company. They said we need to make the lamps simple to use, durable, affordable, rugged. Okay? Design solution uh, appropriate for the context, uh, so essentially leverage all the technological advancements that, uh, that they could. Uh, LED, batteries, solar components, plastics, etc. They came up with an innovated, patented design and three standardized products that they have with increasing functionality. So that's it, three products, and these are the, the kind of products that they make. So it's a simple study lantern, uh, there's a versatile family lantern, and there is a premier lantern with four brightness settings. You can also charge uh, uh, your, your mobile phones, which is very important to, uh, believe it or not, to BOP. Uh, there are probably more mobile phones than, than the people in, uh, in, in, in developing world. Uh, so the, they, are, they are also tough and weather resistant, and they are versatile, so it makes it easy for them to, to, uh, to sell those. But as we said before, Developing the solution is only 10% of the, of the battle, that you need to develop the ecosystem around it to get the solution adopted by, by, by these communities. So what they did was very different choices. Large scale manufacturing, all outsourced, uh, but, uh, but they had regional hubs, both in, in US, India, China, and Africa, to coordinate marketing, sales, and distribution for, uh, for their products. Over 10,000 retail partners, marketing and technical support through their field offices. That's how they, uh, they, they distributed their solution. In terms of developing the ability to pay, uh, same things that Selco did, identification of savings for, for customers uh, from kerosene and healthcare costs, expanded capabilities for economic activity, you can work longer, you can educate yourself better, you can start new businesses. Uh, but the biggest thing that they did was to make the product itself affordable. So these, these lamps actually cost about 400 to 1700 rupees, which is about seven to 30 dollars. Um, they reckon that most of the, the people who actually are convinced about the, the savings aspect, they can spend that much money. But they are also experimenting with uh, Selco-like approaches, which means partnering with banks to, to, to lend for solar loans in, the, in that context. Um, the, the fifth uh, part, building trust and, and reach, as awareness at this time was not really that big an issue for them, uh, was the biggest challenge. Because they lacked local presence, because they lacked the, the access to communities, they, they found it tough to build trust and reach. So their solution was actually very simple. They partnered. <laughs> uh, what they said is that we are going to find people who are trusted by the communities who already have the reach in all of these communities and partner with them. And those partners are very unconventional. That includes the Indian Postal Service. 
which has the reach, which has the, the trust of the community and the cell lamps uh, on behalf of, uh, uh, of Delight. They also partnered with large LPG, or which is the cooking gas uh, distributors, which is used all over uh, the developing world, and these include Bharat Gas, Indusan Petroleum, et cetera. So these guys have the reach, and they are trusted, they're there, and, and they also sell lamps on behalf of uh, uh, Delight. So uh, in addition, they use brand activators as uh, they, they hire people from the local communities, they send them out to, to show how the product works, uh, to give them out on trial so that they can build trust uh, in the community so that uh, people can then um, uh, use the lamps. And then balancing social and financial objectives uh, was uh, different choices but uh, uh, similar outcomes. Balance at the top in terms of the, the management team, uh, making sure that uh, the the, uh, the management team is, uh, is uh, uh, in line with the dual objectives of the organization. Uh, they changed their legal structure, which is one of the big deals that, um, uh, that they did. So they certified them, they, 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 they have a, a certification as a B Corp. B Corp is a benefit corp. Uh, benefit corp is a type of organization that has an explicit social mission while generating profits. So uh, uh, there's an organization called uh, B-Lab, which does the certification for organizations that uh, are looking to have that dual objective. And I believe there are uh, uh, legislations in at least 20 US states, either approved or pending, that would certify an organization or that, or that would allow you to register yourself as a B Corp, which is what they did to, to, to really communicate their social uh, commitment while generating profits. Um, they also have ongoing monitoring and reporting of social impact measures, and two of the, the measures are very widely used uh, in that community these days, which are GEARS, uh, the Global Impact Investing Rating System, and IRIS, which is the Impact Reporting and Investment Standards. So they, they use these, they measure their social impact, they report their social impact uh, regularly on their website, uh, just to, to make sure that they don't get caught into maximizing profits uh, and, and drifting that way. And they also had a mix of patient capital and venture capital. So the, the patient capital in their, in their um, context is uh, Acumen. Acumen is one of the biggest uh, social impact investors these days, uh, and Omidyar Network. And their regular venture capital people are Mahindras, which is one of the biggest business groups in India, uh, DFJ, Garage Technology Ventures, Nexus, et cetera, et cetera. So that's how they made sure that they keep that balance between social and the financial objectives. So what has been their impact? According to the measures that they follow, more than 28 million lives empowered since 2007, more than 7 million school-age children reached, more than 874 million saved in energy-related expenses, over 8 billion hours uh, created for working and studying, uh, as well as about 2 million tons of CO2 offset, and 35 million kilowatt hours generated from renewable energy sources. Okay. So uh, that's something that's at least going part way to, to solve the, the problems that, uh, that we see in, the, in some of these contexts. So I, uh, I'm gonna move on to a, a second challenge, which is uh, clean water and sanitation, and uh, show you maybe one more solution that, uh, uh, or one more story that, uh, that we have discovered, and uh, that, in terms of the challenge for uh, sanitation and clean water, uh, the, 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 the water scarcity in the world is, is um, a serious challenge. What you see here are the, the uh, orange areas where scarcity of water is conditional on economic issues, but there are also areas which are, which are shown in the, in, in the, the darker uh, orange here, which are conditional on geographic circumstances. So in effect, you have about 25% of the population that rely on contaminated water because the clean water is just not available. Uh, you have about 3.75 million people, more than 50% of those children, uh, die every year because of uh, waterborne diseases and about 40 million hours per year just in Africa itself carrying water back and forth uh, from different water sources. Those water sources that many of these communities rely on tend to be the, the local ponds and, 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 uh, and wells and, and rivers. And uh, uh, those sources are occasionally used for, for uh, washing uh, clothes, dishes, as well as drinking sources. Okay? And the, the, the potential for waterborne diseases becomes a huge deal. The, uh, uh, prim primarily, most of the households 
the responsibility for fetching water falls on women. And uh, that limits gender equality, that limits opportunities for women to, to, to improve uh, their, their, their uh, economic opportunities through education, through other uh, so on, uh, sources. Uh, on average, estimates indicate that women can spend up to six hours per day just fetching water from many of these sources. So what are some solutions that work? One of the solutions that we, that we uh, found is water health. Uh, this is an organization with the mission to provide scalable, safe, affordable water solutions to underserved populations. Um, this is also a for-profit social enterprise. They are based, uh, they, they're based in, uh, uh, in Ghana, uh, but they have offices and sales in, in India, Bangladesh, Philippines, and also expanding in Liberia and Nigeria. Their target market is low-income customers, two to five dollars a day, most of them rural. Okay. Uh, solution that they came up with is, is uh, again, following the same uh, model that we have been talking about, understanding user needs and context, design solutions appropriate for the context. And in fact, the, the start of this company was uh, from an innovative uh, ultraviolet technology for purifying water that was developed at the, uh, the Lawrence Berkeley uh, National Labs in, in, in California. So the founders first tried to sell that as a solution. And then they realized that, again, coming up with a solution is, is not a solution at all. You really need to reconceptualize that as a need, as a solution to fulfill a need, and then put all of the infrastructure around it before you can actually get the solution adopted. So that, that's what they did. They, they really then, then uh, reconfigured their business model and say, OK, we really need to provide a need. They really need to provide a solution for the need, and then put the infrastructure that uh, that, the, that we need to, to have. Uh, this, they, they incorporated that uh, UV technology into what they call a seven stage uh, purification process uh, that takes uh, the, the water sources in the community and through filtration, through reverse osmosis, through UV disinfection, et cetera, et cetera, uh, it outputs uh, water which meets or exceeds the WHO standards for uh, most of the communities that they work in. Uh, how do they develop the ecosystem around the product and the need to, to make uh, this available? Uh, it's very interesting business model, actually. They have a decentralized community water purification centers, which they call water health centers. Uh, so these are uh, uh, small to medium-sized centers, uh, which can handle about 21,000 to 65,000 liters per day. Uh, they are modular, they are scalable and they can be fitted to meet the needs of the community. So the, the target villages have anywhere from 3,000, 10,000 people that they, are, that they are looking at. The, um, they also form public-private partnerships, uh, and this was uh, very, very important for them because they, they, they got land concessions from the community. Uh, so community essentially lends them or, or leases them the land for about 10 to 15 years, uh, and community provides the labor, the, the inputs, and up to about 60% of the cost of uh, putting the... Uh, uh, water health center in that community. And uh, uh, water health operates them as a build, operate, transfer model. So what they do is uh, they, they build it using the, the labor and the inputs uh, from the community so the community gets ownership uh, right away from the, from the beginning in developing the solution. They operate it, and then at the end of the concession, about 10 to 15 years later, they transfer the, the center back to the community and community is free to run whichever way they want to. Okay. Uh, Finally, they, they also hire and train local individuals to involve them as part of that, that solution. Uh, here is a very quick uh, uh, a photo a montage of uh, uh, their, their process. So they can actually build that water health center within 20 days, uh, from site allocation to laying the foundation and so on and so forth, uh, putting that uh, modular structure up, installing the, the uh, technology, by day 20 is ready to dispense. Um, that's that's quick. So this is some of the the this is how the the finished uh, water health center actually looks like in uh, some of the places that they, they have this as uh, operational. So uh, and so the happy customers. What they also do is uh, communities that live around uh, can can get access to water by just walking to the water health center and buying the water. Uh, but they also have local entrepreneurs who can deliver the water to communities far away. Yep. So that supports more jobs, creates more economic opportunities for other people uh, involved in that. Finally, they needed to do 
both the things that other people did, developing ability to pay, as well as uh, building trust reach and awareness in the community. So they, they handled these together because what they found was a strong resistance to paying for water. Most of these communities expected water to be free. So it's, it's, a, it's a right, it's a government's job to provide water uh, to us. Uh, and they had to overcome that, that resistance to, to pay for water if they wanted to have a sustainable solution that they could scale uh, to different uh, uh, locations. So they involved, they, they engaged the communities in extensive awareness education campaigns, uh, linking essentially safe water to health uh, and to productivity issues. And uh, uh, finally, what they also did was to keep the cost very, very low. So essentially, you, you get about a 20 liter can for six rupees, which is way lower than most of the other commercially available solutions in, um, in most of the developing countries. So it's about 10 cents for a 20 liter can that they, that they did. Uh, finally then, to balance the social and the financial objectives, uh, such mix of patient and venture capital, uh, their social objective is clear in everything that they do, uh, but they made sure that their patient investors are, again, Acumen, uh, International Finance Corp, USAID, and uh, their venture capital side is uh, Dow Venture, Tata, and they have a, a recent uh, a collaboration with, uh, with Coke and, and Diageo to expand their water health centers in Africa. So uh, what is the impact that they have had so far? Uh, over 500 water health centers in six countries, expanding to over 1,000 by 2015. 150 delivery service providers, these are new businesses that they, that they, they created around their water health centers. About five million people have access to pure drinking water through their, their solution, and what they say about 700 million liters of purified water dispensed annually. Okay, so that's um, uh, some of their impact. The, the indirect impact is, is um, uh, kind of clear. A study actually showed that consumer households are 10 times less likely to experience a waterborne disease uh, and 1.4 times less likely to experience any illness uh, as a result of having access to clean water, saving them time and effort, enabling employment, and higher productivity. Okay. Um, how am I doing on time? <laughs> if, uh, if I have the, the go-ahead, I will try and wrap this up uh, very quickly, but I just want to quickly talk about a, a final a challenge, which is the agriculture and, uh, and food production. Uh, numbers indicate you have about 840 million people in the world who suffer from uh, undernourishment. And uh, in addition to that, the projections indicate that the, the world population will increase to about uh, 8.3 by 2030, 9 billion by 2050. That means the food demand is predicted to increase by over 50% by 2030 and 70% by 2050. And that poses a serious challenge. The, the reason that poses a serious challenge is that access to food in rural areas is actually dependent on access to water for irrigation. And a, a lot of the, the poor, essentially the poor, for example in Africa, 70% of the, the population is rural. And, and increasing agriculture incomes becomes a big, big priority if you want to do anything about poverty alleviation. Okay? So uh, again, this is uh, just a confirmation of uh, all that I just said. If you look at the numbers, 77% of the extremely poor tend to live in rural areas compared to about 53% uh, uh, of the non-poor. 63% of the, the extremely poor tend to be dependent on agriculture. So want to do anything about poverty alleviation, you have to address some of the agriculture-related issues or, or food production issues uh, in, in many of these developing countries. So solutions that work. This is a very interesting company that, uh, that, we, that we work with. This is called Kickstart. Uh, Kickstart has a mission to get millions of people out of poverty quickly, cost-effectively, sustainably, and in so doing, change the way world fights poverty. So uh, they are actually currently a nonprofit, but they generate revenues with the objective that by the time that they develop the market enough, they will become a for-profit sustainable organization. So they are based in Kenya, Tanzania, uh, Mali, Burkina Faso. Uh, what do they do? Their biggest um, um, product is a money maker water pump. So essentially they make these human power tools that help farmers make money. Uh, this is a picture of uh, their water pump that, uh, uh, that they built. 
the motivation for the founders to do this uh, is very interesting. I think I'll, I'll uh, use that as some of the, the lessons that we have learned uh, by, by working on, on, these, uh, uh, on this project. Uh, that failure of traditional development based on aid and charity, that uh, the, both the founders actually worked in, uh, in uh, international aid organizations and saw that aid alone cannot solve the issues. The issues are too big. At the same time, what they also thought was the private sector lacks incentive to make the initial investments to develop the market. As we have seen, that uh, infrastructures are lacking, markets are lacking, and that initial investment is very, very costly. Hence, most of the private sector doesn't make the investment to, um, uh, to do anything about that. And then they saw, well, certain innovations can have these multiplier effects. So they can generate jobs, they can generate economic activity in the community, and hence uh, they can lift people out of poverty much better than many of the other solutions that are based on aid and charity. Uh, finally, what they say is, uh, well, making money is the biggest challenge of any poor person in the world. So our objective is to help people get out of poverty by enabling them with tools that can help them get out of poverty. So the solution that they came up with, I'm going to use their description, uh, what they say is five-step process to, to eradicate poverty. And as you will see, that five-step process is actually very, very similar to all the things that we have been talking about so far. Identify opportunities, design products, establish a supply chain, develop the market, measure and move along. This is, this is all their words, uh, uh, not mine. What do they do? Identify opportunities. They, they say, well, tools to enable businesses are suited to poor people. We want to start with local solutions, local first, low initial investment, quick payback, use assets poor have in abundance. I don't want tools that save labor. I want tools that use labor and time that poor can use to, to make money and generate new businesses. So uh, this is a, an interesting quote that I think captures the, the way they work. They say, if you plant yourself in the middle of a village in Africa and ask yourself, if this were my town and I was trying to figure out a way to make money and I had an engineer's mind, what would I do? What business would I get into? And, and, and what tools or technologies might help me make that business more profitable? And say, this is how we approach. So I want to provide people with those tools and technologies that I would have used myself to make money and get myself out of poverty. Okay. So uh, in terms of uh, designing the products, the, the local design for local solutions, their design uh, offices are, or design engineers are all based in Kenya, where they spend considerable amount of time with the communities, and they follow rigorous design criteria. Uh, those, uh, those criteria include income generating, anything that they do, any, any tool that they make has to be income generating. It has to be quick return on investment because poor don't have that much money to, to buy the tools, so it has to be less than six months uh, return on investment. It has to be affordable, energy efficient, portable, easy to install and use, culturally acceptable, and it should be designed for manufacturability so I can actually take it to someone and make it in large quantities. Okay. Uh, the uh, next step, establishing a supply chain or the ecosystem around that product or service or the need or the solution that uh, everyone else is doing. Uh, so they actually outsource the manufacturing. Uh, they use uh, high volume centralized manufacturing processes in their opinion this is why this is how cars computers cell phones are made this is why cell phones are, are cheap and, and uh, uh, affordable and we want to use the same processes so but then they recruit local wholesalers distributors retailers uh, those include for-profit companies as well as NGOs and they tend to be part of the community they know the community they're trusted by the community and sell their solution through those uh, those channels and then finally they say we want to sell not give away because giving away doesn't solve the issue. That you need to have involvement from the person that the person is actually going to use that to generate income, to, to, to make money and get out of poverty. So let's say profitable supply chain is self-sustaining. So uh, the, the next step, developing the market, uh, essentially what they, the way they approached it is that you need to build confidence in the, in the products. They say promises made, promises kept. And uh, they do a lot of uh, education uh, in the communities to, to make sure that people trust their products. They also do demonstrations of products in stores, uh, on farm, and something quite interesting, they have community water pumping competitions to show people this actually works. So um, this is a quote that I think captures their mindset. It says, risk averse, cash, con uh, cash constraint, isolated, dream market. So uh, this, is, this is what uh, we would do, what other people would get scared of and not. Uh, approach that market. Measure and move along. So they say, okay, our, our criteria for success are 
uh, do the people whom we have helped out of poverty stay out of poverty? Uh, can uh, more people avail themselves of the solution without additional investment from us? And is, uh, is a Kickstart becoming more self-sufficient as an organization? Uh, what they say time to tipping point is uh, for them about 12 to 14 years. That this is how long it takes for us to develop a market to the point where other people can jump in and find solutions for, uh, uh, for that market. And say one sales reach about 15 to 20% of the total market potential. Yep. Their impact has been uh, quite interesting. Over 235,000 pumps sold, but what they, they, they focus on is over 150,000 small enterprises started. With that, over 770,000 people moved out of poverty uh, and over 130 million in new profits and wages generated annually. Yep. So this is how they, they bring sustainable solutions to, to, to bear. So in, in um, um, I'm going to skip this video maybe uh, and just uh, move on. The, the, back to my research question uh, that, that we started with, can business help alleviate poverty? The examples that we have, we have uh, learned from, uh, I think the answer is yes. There are, we have talked about 95 uh, so far, but there are literally thousands and thousands of organizations out there that are doing that, that are, that are, that are doing exactly what uh, uh, some of these organizations that we talked about are doing. So the interesting question is how? And I think there are a few lessons that, uh, that I would like to just uh, leave with. How do entrepreneurs help uh, alleviate poverty? How does business help alleviate poverty? I think one of the, the, the big uh, issues here is plugging the voids. That is, entrepreneurs help uh, uh, close the holes, close the gaps that are left between what the public sector can do or has the resources uh, or the political will to do and what the private sector has incentives to do. This is where all of the social entrepreneurs come in. This, this, is, this is their job to actually, they, they find that challenging, they find that uh, uh, stimulating, and they find solutions that uh, would plug, the, uh, plug those holes. In so doing, they also expand access to basic necessities of life. And uh, that could be food, water, electricity, uh, and so on and so forth. And in, in expanding access to basic necessities of life, this is essentially contributing to a better quality of life, as we just talked about in the beginning, what the implications of living in poverty are. Third, they also facilitate job creation, capability building through education, training, involvement of communities uh, uh, that, is, uh, that can become self-sustaining. Uh, Fourth, they do engage the communities uh, from the beginning in, in coming up with the solution, in delivering the solution, and taking ownership of the solution so that solution becomes sustainable uh, over time. Lastly, that, and but not the least, that they help develop the markets. That uh, they, they, by, by um, plugging the voids, by uh, expanding opportunities, by, by encouraging economic activity, they bring the markets up to a point where other people can jump in, where other entrepreneurs can take advantage of, of, of uh, the opportunities that are available that helps expand access to, uh, to many of these goods and services that, that poor lack. So uh, very quickly, what are the lessons for business? It's opportunity, not charity. You want to focus on creating opportunity, not giving charity. Second. It's empowerment, not pity. Uh, this is not what they're looking for. Uh, third, you need to realize that uh, it is about delivering a need, and that need needs to be delivered in context. So the, the business opportunity lies in, cre in, in fulfilling that need and creating a solution that fulfills that need uh, uh, and delivered in context. How do you deliver that, uh, that solution? You have to have cross-sector partnerships and collaboration. That all of these organizations that we talk for, uh, they realize that no one has the resources, no one has the capabilities, no one has the trust reach, et cetera, et cetera, to deliver the solution themselves. So that includes nonprofits, for-profits, community organizations, and so on and so forth, uh, that you would need to involve in cross-sector partnerships to, to, to be able to deliver the solution. And finally, it is financial returns and social impact. That, uh, that, that, that mindset of maximizing profits, I guess, needs to change or has changed already. I don't know. Uh, but that, that dual objective is what generates sustainable enterprises. Uh, and many of these solutions are examples of those sustainable enterprises. So I'm going to stop here and take any of the questions that you may have.
Well, thank you very much, Sadir. There is a chance now for some, uh, some questions or comments. Thank you. Thank you for bringing the mic to me. Um, that was a really, really um, inspirational talk. That was excellent. Thank you very much. Um, I could ask about a dozen questions, but I'll limit it to a couple of simple ones. Um, I'd expected you to talk more about information technology and the accessibility of cell phone technology and things like that. Um, in the third world in the developing countries and there wasn't much on that so I was wondering if you could uh, maybe give a couple of uh, whether or not your any of your 95 companies uh, looked at uh, information technology um, um. and then uh, and then second question um, was also about uh, uh, where do you think microfinance Grameen Bank and and Kiva and organizations like that fit into these type of business models that you're researching thank you thanks for the for the question it, uh, kind of gives me a chance to expand on things that are left out and uh, uh, I think uh, uh, one of the, the interns uh, from Infosys who helped collect m most of this data, who's working on this project is actually here, so I think she's nodding her head that I told you to include microfinance. <laughs> uh, um, excellent questions. The microfinance issue I deliberately left out because it's more contentious <laughs> in a way. And, and uh, that stems from, I think, a lot of history that has gone into microfinance. The, uh, we talked to about, uh, I think, over 30 companies that are in, in, in microfinance, and consistently what we found was a little bit of ambivalence in terms of how microfinance can be used, uh, how microfinance has been good or not, and what microfinance can be. So I think the initial model that was developed by, by Muhammad Yunus, uh, which kind of started the whole social business idea and so on and so forth, uh, that got adapted in many ways uh, over the years. I'm sure many of you are probably aware of um, the scandals that happened uh, around microfinance in, in uh, southern India, uh, where essentially the issue became that people got greedy, <laughs> that uh, they walked away from their social objective and started focusing on maximizing profits. And uh, I think that uh, served as a, a warning to many of the the microfinance institutes that uh, we cannot walk away from the social objectives. That the moment you do that, the moment you start focusing on, on maximizing returns, uh, you not only lose the credibility, uh, but if you are a for-profit company, for example, you are listed, some of these companies were, the market is going to punish you too. So, uh, there, is, so there is all that that is happening in microfinance. Hence, I think if I, if I talk about microfinance, probably the entire lecture would, would be focused on microfinance. Just uh, too many things that are going on. The second issue of IT, uh, we actually looked at IT in two different ways. One was the use of IT in uh, microfinance and whether IT can be used by microfinance institutes to uh, improve their uh, transparency, to improve their processes, to reduce their costs, hence find ways to be more sustainable as well as have their social impact that they, that they started with. And uh, the, the solution that we have been studying is mobile banking. And uh, 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 so we are we're still kind of in the process of um, uh, uh, finding the, the, what the major takeaways are and so on and so forth. But what we have seen is that there is a new breed of microfinance institutes that uh, realize that finding ways to improve their efficiency will actually allow them to keep both the social objectives as well as their financial returns. So uh, if they can use their IT systems to reduce their cost, they can in turn reduce the cost of borrowing to the consumers. So they don't have to go after the consumers and push them to pay as much because they can be more effective that, by, by doing things differently. So, uh, but that's preliminary. And uh, so I, I didn't want to share the findings that are not at least at the moment confirmed by the research else wants to ask a question or offer a comment while well, we have the opportunity? Down here. Uh, thank you for the lecture. It was great. Um, I'm from Ghana, so I was very excited to see that uh, uh, Water Health was doing now uh, what it was doing there. I think it's uh, excellent. Um, in terms of what it was doing, you said that it was um, Water Health allows some, uh, some people to, to become entrepreneurs by uh, carrying water to certain places that are far away so that people can have access to water. How has the impact of some of these companies in terms of entrepreneurship, uh, building entrepreneurs locally, um, how, how has the impact been? Uh, how has these companies been able to create more entrepreneurs from what they're doing? Yep. 
So uh, again, great question, thanks. Uh, I think, uh, uh, as, as I was trying to show also, many of them have that as an explicit objective, that they want to create entrepreneurship uh, around the solutions that they have. So for example, water health, the, the entrepreneurial opportunities they are creating are not only in uh, the carrying the water and so on, but they're also around uh, uh, the techniques and uh, the training that they provide. So for example, uh, they build these water health centers in collaboration with the community. And many of those people can go on and, and start their jobs because now they can do masonry, they can do uh, plumbing, they can do electrical maintenance, and so on. And many of them stay with, the, with water health and, and find jobs there. So similarly for everyone else, by the way, the uh, Selco generated a lot of entrepreneurs uh, around their solutions. Uh, one of the, the most talked about of the uh, entrepreneurial opportunities that Selco generated is uh, a, a guy who uh, uh, rents out batteries. So he has over 100 vegetable vendors uh, on the streets of, of Bangalore who are his customers. So he, he charges the batteries during the day. At 4 o'clock, he starts his round. He goes around. He rents the battery for 15 rupees a, uh, 15 rupees a night, which the vegetable vendors are very happy to pay because they can work longer. They can generate more income. And uh, it's a win-win for, for all of them. So in terms of numbers, I don't have specific numbers because I'm not sure they themselves understand how much of the multiplier effects they have had by creating entrepreneurial opportunities. But all of them do that. All of them have their uh, one of the primary objectives being generating entrepreneurial opportunities around the solution that they are, they are having. Hi, thank you so much for the lecture. Um, I just had a quick question for you about um, the generalizability of the results that you have seen from your, through your research and whether um, the strategies that you um, went through for each of the different challenges, how, general, how much they can be um, um, generalized and whether the causes of poverty um, affect it. So if we're thinking about more local social enterprises, do you think there are any specific challenges, whether they be systemic or um, from the government that would change things? Or do you think you could follow the same um, kind of outline um, a great question. Uh, I think uh, when we try and, and publish results based on these studies, this is the kind of question we get from reviewers, for example. So <laughs> how do I know whether what you're saying is uh, generalizable? Uh, I can say that it is generalizable across the companies we have studied. And, uh, uh, and it is generalizable across contexts because I think we do have fairly wide geographical representation. Uh, whether it generalizes to companies in the developed economies, uh, I am not so certain because we have not studied those companies. So I think there is a, quite a bit of learning for us to do there, uh, whether these solutions can be adapted to uh, poverty reduction efforts, uh, such as the, the in, in, in Surrey and around. Uh, I, I'm, I'm willing to, to engage in that, in, that, in that learning process, but uh, I cannot say based on the current samples that whether or not solutions would generalize to other contexts in there. Just say that the BD School of Business has, in addition to doing this kind of great research, recently initiated a social innovation center for students here in Vancouver um, called RADIUS, Radical Ideas Useful for Society. So perhaps some of the, uh, the results from that initiative will help inform how generalizable uh, some of these findings are, along with other social innovation uh, and entrepreneurship that's going on. Over here. Hi, thank you. Um, relating to uh, what, what she said about, you know, is there a general framework that works? Um, have you ever done, have you, do, have you done um, case studies in terms of um, how, finding how that their actual entrepreneur, the entrepreneur, how, he, how their frame, their, their, the way they think in terms of their vision, I guess, how does, the, how does that individual, how does the individual role play in uh, generating a successful project or a successful uh, business enterprise. So whether we have studied uh, how entrepreneurs uh, approach the solution, or are you seeing a general sh trend, or is it all is it all a model? Is it like if you follow a specific model, then you're going to create success, or is there something unique in terms of each of these projects and each of these entrepreneurs specifically? Well, what we're trying to to do is we can, we're trying to find the common process that all of these entrepreneurs engage in to bring the solutions to sustainability. Uh, but 
different entrepreneurs, as also I think I tried to show with the, with the two examples of Selco versus uh, Delight, different entrepreneurs approach is very differently because the context in which they start is different, because their own experiences are different. And uh, uh, whatever works in terms of bringing that solution to, to the market to, 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 uh, to scale, uh, they will do. But I think what is common across all of the entrepreneurs is that passion, that they see these as challenges to be solved. They, they see that, uh, in fact, uh, one of the videos that, that I skipped, uh, if you were to, uh, to listen to the person who started uh, Selco, he says, you want challenge? You come here. You know, this is, you can have, you're spoiled for challenges. So I think that's the, the common uh, pattern that we have seen, that they see these as challenges. Then they go out and say, okay, what do I need to do to solve that challenge? I am not really faced by, by there being lack of institutions, but there being lack of money, there being lack of support, lack of understanding, and so on and so forth. I can put all that in place. So uh, while we have not done uh, systematic case studies uh, to explore that further, I think that is probably the commonality across all of the entrepreneurs that we have studied. Take two more questions or comments before we uh, have a chance to, to converse over, over some coffee and cookies. Uh, I like how you mentioned how the companies must be for profit in order to be sustainable. Um, I like the idea of how Selco used solar loans in order to, to generate that uh, revenue. But I find it hard to believe that all these companies are able – I find like uh, a huge limitation, a huge uh, problem for these companies is generating revenue. For example, Water Health, I didn't really understand how they were able to generate revenue. They're creating these, these centers and they're teaching people about the importance to, uh, to buy the water and they keep the costs low, but are they able to, gener to keep costs uh, to generate the, the, the money needed? Like I found out that's a huge problem across some of these for-profits. For, for, for Water Health, uh, they actually sell water. They don't give it away. So that's how they generate revenue. So they, they sell water for about six cents per 20 liter can. Uh, Sorry? Can the people afford it? Oh, yeah. That, that's uh, the, the evidence is that they can. So, but they needed to engage the community in that in the education process before people will say that, yes, I, I will find the money uh, because it's worthwhile for me to do that. Uh, but this is how exactly all of the entrepreneurs are working, that they say that it is not necessarily just the lack of money and lack of affordability that, uh, that is the issue. It is finding a way to connect the people to the solution and say that, yes, if there is a way that you see value in it, they will pay for it. And this is so for electricity, it is so for, uh, for water. In fact, many of them use cell phones as an example, coming back to, to what uh, uh, was said earlier, that they say, well, look at cell phones. <laughs> that uh, you would think that who would pay four or 500 rupees or, or more, uh, we're not even talking about iPhones and so on, uh, to buy a cell phone when you don't have enough money to, to feed your family. But apparently, most people think that cell phone is a very valuable tool for them to have. They can use it to generate more income, hence they pay for cell phones. And that has become, I think, uh, for many of these people, it has become the, the gold standard. Say, so, okay, if we can find what motivates people to buy cell phone, maybe I can try to do the same with the, with the service that I'm trying to provide. Same for water, same for electricity, same for the, the pump, for example, that they're selling, and many other solutions that people are coming up with. But in general, I agree, it is a challenge. But you have to, that's why I try to show that you have to find a way to connect value so that people are actually willing to pay. I want to say this has been a really special lecture for me because Sadir started off saying that uh, the idea for some of this research came about at a, uh, during a mission that I participated in and, and Dean Shapiro and, uh, and Sadir were on in India. I, I didn't realize that on that mission you were uh, actually laying the groundwork for this research, so it's great uh, to hear it and see what's come out of that. The other thing is we spent a lot of time during that trip uh, discussing what it meant to be a social entrepreneur or social innovation, and the dean tried to explain it to me. He did a good job, but you did a much better job tonight. Um, and so on behalf of all of us, I really want to thank you for sharing your research, your insight. Uh, I think it's been very illuminating and encouraging to know uh, that there is work going on and research going on at Simon Fraser to shine a light, even if it's uh, not a solar light, on, uh, on efforts uh, to use business knowledge to address social problems. So uh, please join with me in thanking uh, Sudhir Gupta for a great lecture. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs>